let's start. Let me read the little introduction here about this Slaybaugh, S-L-A-Y-B-A-U-G-H, um, testimony. And Rose is writing, the wife. The husband is Roy, Roy and Rose Slaybaugh. We have traveled many thousands of miles all the way from Los Angeles, California, to Oshawa, Ontario, from Billingham, Washington, to Key West, Florida, and across to Havana, Cuba, to tell the wonderful way in which God has worked in our lives. We have been urged by hundreds of people to put our story into a book, and now the time has come for us to do so. We do it with the hope that our testimony will greatly glorify our Heavenly Father and will build confidence and faith in His goodness and power in the hearts of all who read it, and I should say, who listen to it. Perhaps this testimony will help some who have become discouraged, and we're starting a new book tonight. In this story, we would like to tell you how we became Christians after the death of our only child. We want to tell you of the struggles we had, of the opposition of friends and relatives, and even the clergy. Anything we write is not done maliciously against anyone personally or against any group of people or denomination. That is not the purpose in telling our story, but we must tell it just as it happened, or it would not be our true experience. And now we're going into Chapter 1, Tragedy and Awakening. When Roy and I married, Roy, let's see, how can I fix this book so I'm not bent over? When Roy and I married, Roy was everything I wanted in a husband. He was good, kind, and thoughtful, but I think I was just a little disappointed after the honeymoon, for when I asked, Darling, don't you think we should start going to Sunday school and church now? He smiled a little and said, Rose, you you run along to Sunday school the way you're used to doing, but you know Sunday school and church are for women and children. No real he-man goes to church. He was right at the height of his career. He was a wrestler. <laughs> I suppose the world would call him a roughneck, but he was a good one, and I loved him. Roy and I were fortunate to have been born of Christian parents. His mother and father were strict Methodist, mine strict Roman Catholics. Sorry, I, I got on the wrong line or misread. Let me start again. His mother and father were strict Methodist, mine strict Baptists. I cannot remember the time that I was not taken to Sunday school and church. I think I was born a church member. Roy cannot say that, however, because after he reached the age when a boy is too old to spank and be made to go to Sunday school, he believed he had all the religion he needed. He thought he had finished his Christian experience, but not I. I had always been a worker in one department of the church or another. When I was just a little slip of a girl, I was a teacher of the little ones. First I taught in the kindergarten division, then the primary, and when I grew older, I was given a high school group. For many years, I was the teacher of those boys and girls. This was not because I was a student of the scriptures, for I was not. But I think I knew about as much about the fundamental teachings of the Bible as the ordinary churchgoer. Many times I stood in the classroom and looked at the pictures of Daniel in the lion's den that hung on the wall and wondered, how did he ever get into that place? Why was he in there? Did he ever get out of it? It never occurred to me to read the story in the Bible. We had never had a Sunday school lesson dealing with it 
or heard a sermon preached about it. In a few years, our home was blessed with a tiny baby. A baby boy, how we loved that precious little bundle of life. We named him Jack. We didn't need anything more. We were completely happy that we didn't want anything else in this world. But this was not long true of our little one. He was growing and beginning to ask questions, and he would often ask Mom and Daddy, Can't I have a little brother and sister like Mildred across the street? Well, we had to find a little one that needed a home. About this time, I was called to sing at the funeral of a young mother who had died suddenly, leaving her husband and three little children, two girls and a boy. <clears throat> oh, how I wanted that blue-eyed girl. Later, we got acquainted with the father, and I asked him, dear, I asked him if I could have little Shirley. <clears throat> he didn't want to give up his children, and he did not want to separate the girls. Lorraine was two years older and a sweet child. To our great joy, we were able to arrange with him to take both of the girls. Now our family was growing rapidly, one boy and two girls. We were all happy together, especially Jack. He loved the girls as though they were his own sisters and was always concerned about them. Soon another little girl came into our lives. She was older than the other children. I practically sneaked her in the back door. When Roy came home the day she arrived, he asked me about her, who she was and where she came from, and I told him, oh, just another little guest. Well, he said, Rose, can't you be satisfied now, three girls and a boy? After all, I do have to make the living, you know. We should have had a dozen. We had so much fun together. The girls are all married now and have, have homes of their own. Did I send these children to Sunday school? No, I didn't send them. I went with them. On Sunday, there was usually a late breakfast, and after breakfast, a scramble to the front porch for the funny papers. Each little one would seize a sheet and settle down on the living room floor because they had to hurry and exchange so they could read all the sheets before we had to leave. Presently, I would look at the clock. Now, darlings, we must hurry. It's almost 10 o'clock, and we mustn't be late for Sunday school. In each little hand was placed a penny. Those pennies did not always reach their proper destination, for right down on the corner was a grocery store where penny candy was sold. The children just swarmed around that corner every Sunday morning on their way to church. After the services were over, we would hurry home. And then it was the children who were hurrying me. Oh, Mommy, Mommy, hurry. Look what time it is. It's almost two, and we mustn't be late for the show. This time, in each little hand was placed ten cents. Sometimes the children would beg, Oh, if we could only have two dimes today. There are two shows, and we'd like to see both of them. If one is just awfully good, couldn't we stay and see it over again? I thought the moving picture theater was the finest place in the world for children. I did not know they were sending them to that we were sending them to the devil's playhouse, but surely God has forgiven us for that, as well as for many other things of which we were ignorant. And what were Mother and Dad doing all Sunday afternoon? At home, reading the precious truths in God's Word? Oh, no, far from that. We either had friends come in or were guests in their homes. 
All afternoon and away into the evening, we were playing cards. That is the way we honored the Lord. Life went on in this careless way until God took a hand in our affairs. By this time, our son was tall and handsome, 20 years old. We were living in Moscow, Idaho. One day, Jack complained of a slight pain in his throat and the back of his neck. I called the local doctor. After examining Jack, he said, This isn't anything for a local doctor. Hurry him to Spokane. I'll call the specialists, Dr. Sproul and Dr. Joseph Lynch. I'll have a room ready for you in the Sacred Heart Hospital. Oh, we hurried Jack there the same afternoon. The doctors were waiting for us. They soon diagnosed Jack's case and told us the dreadful news that Jack could not live. He had cerebral meningitis in its worst form. We couldn't understand what they were talking about. This happening to us? No, not to our Jack. He had never been sick a day in his life, aside from the diseases of childhood. Special nurses were placed on his case. Among them was a young man who was given the duty of placing hot compresses on Jack's eyes and ears. His name was Wavered Lamb, and he was the same age as our son. Wavered was a real Christian. He was not only taking care of Jack's physical needs, which was, of course, important, but even more so, he was helping Jack with his spiritual needs. <clears throat> he was a true witness for Christ, telling Jack all about the wonderful plan of salvation and the love of Jesus. Soon, he was praying with our boy. Wavered told us a few months ago, when we had dinner with him in his apartment in Los Angeles, how he used to slip his Bible under the tray and cover it with a napkin in order to read it to Jack. At the time, we didn't know that all this was going on in Jack's room. Near the end, Roy said to me, Rose, Jack is dying. Shouldn't someone pray with him? I answered, Roy, I've never really been taught to pray. You pray. Rose, after all, you should know how, he said. You are the church member of the family. Although we had been reared in Christian homes, neither Roy nor I had ever heard our mothers or fathers pray, aside from offering the blessing at the table. Now had come the crucial time in our son's life. If ever Jack needed praying parents, it was now, but how utterly we failed him. The only prayer I, ta I taught our children, the only prayer that I had ever been taught, was the childish prayer, now I lay me down to sleep. But God never fails anyone. He placed wavered lamb in the room with Jack during that week. Almost a week passed. It was Wednesday night. Wavered was in the room a long time. We knew Jack was slipping away from us rapidly and had but a few hours left. Finally, Wavered came out and held the door open for us to go in. He could see that Roy and I had been crying. Our hearts were just crushed and broken. As he held the door open for us, he said, Folks, I wish you wouldn't feel so bad about Jack. He is going to be all right. I'll remember him again in my prayers tonight. I said, Young man, what did you say? I'll remember him in my prayers tonight. Why, young man, what kind of a church do you belong to? Guess what he said. I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. All I could say was, oh, 
I had never seen an Adventist before. We had heard about these people and how strange and peculiar they were supposed to be. <clears throat> but here was one of them, a young man who knew how to pray and who was praying for our darling. It did not make any difference to us what church he belonged to. He knew how to pray. It was Thursday morning. Jack was asleep. All the pain was gone. The doctors came in and said, Don't disturb him. He will awaken during the day. Toward evening, he started moving around a little bit. He opened his eyes, and as he did so, he looked at a beautiful picture of the boy Jesus opposite on the wall. Jack looked at it for a while and then said, Dear Jesus, then he looked over at us and said, Oh, please, please, turn to Christ. I said, Yes, darling, we will. He said, Thank you, Mom. Now I must kiss you goodbye. I reached down and kissed him, and Rory reached down and kissed him too. But Jack reached his hands up and said, Oh, Dad, I must kiss you on the face again. He seemed to be worried about his father, for his father never went to Sunday school and church with us. Then he closed his eyes and went to sleep. It was all over. He will rest until the life-giver calls him again. When our son died, life went out of us also. What was there left for us to live for? All our plans, all our hopes had centered around our son. We couldn't lie down and, well, why couldn't we lie down and die with him? But we had to go on living the best we could. Next chapter. We moved back to the farm. One evening, Rory and I were sitting in front of the fireplace talking things over. He said to me, Rose, now I'd like to be a church member. I'd like to go to church with you. I'd like to do what Jack asked us to do, and I want to be a real Christian. I would said, Roy, so do I. What church shall we join? It doesn't make very much difference difference which church we join, he said. They are all more or less alike, but I do want to join a church that believes in baptism by immersion. I do want to be baptized the way the Bible teaches, the way Jesus was baptized. I said, all right, how would the Christian church be? Roy said that would be all right. So I called the minister of the large downtown Christian church in Spokane, told him who we were, told him who we were, and asked if we could be baptized and join his church. He said he would be happy to do just that. Next Sunday morning, you be in church, and when I give the invitation, just walk down the aisle. I'll meet you and ask you a few questions. He called up later in the week and said, We are going to make that baptism Sunday night. Next Sunday is Easter, and our choir is singing a cantata. We would like to combine the two. We were there Sunday evening, sitting in the back row. After the music, the minister gave the invitation, and Roy and I stepped out alone and walked down the aisle. He met us, shook our hands, asked us a few simple questions, and we were baptized while the congregation was singing. Then we came back and signed our names together in a book, and now we were both members and happy. The minister did not ask us about our characters, our habits, nor did he ask us any or nor did he give us any instruction in the Christian faith. He did not tell Roy that he should stop drinking and smoking. He did not tell us that we should stop our movie-going, 
our card playing, our dancing. He told us nothing whatever about Christian living. But I think we fooled the minister just a little bit because we went home and started studying the Bible. We had a beautiful Bible just as pretty and new as it was 25 years before when Roy had given it to me as a gift. We did not use that Bible every day. We couldn't let it lie around the house carelessly. We had to take care of it. It was always placed in the bookcase on a shelf. Whenever I would entertain the Ladies' Aid Society, or when the pastor would call, I, uh, let's see, I was always proud to present that beautiful Bible. The minister would open it and read a verse or two, and then it was put away for safekeeping. Once in a while, the children would get it down and look at the pictures, and I would say, Oh, no, no, honey, not this pretty book. If you want to look at pictures, you have your own picture books and comic books. I would take it away from them and place it high out of reach of their little hands. But now we got the Bible down, this beautiful new Bible, and started opening the pages, many of which had never been opened before. Have you ever heard of anyone quarreling about a Bible? I do not mean really quarreling, but when I had it, I would be reading something interesting and Roy would say, Rose, don't you think it's my turn <laughs> to have it for just a little while? Then he would tell me by the clock just how long I had had it. I would hand it over to him and sit and watch the clock and pretty soon I'd say, Come on, honey, hand it over. It's my turn to have it. And reluctantly, he would hand it back. We soon put a stop to that, though. We bought another Bible. But that didn't help much. No, I would be reading something interesting and say, I didn't know this before. And Roy would say, Rose, come see what I found in mine. And I'd say, honey, if you knew what I'm reading here, you would close your Bible and come over here and see what I found. What do you think we were looking for? We wanted to read with our very own eyes. Just what the minister had said at Jack's funeral. That he went right straight to heaven. And that he was there waiting day by day for mother and dad to join him. The minister said he was up there singing with the angels and praising God. He had also said, take the shape of the grave. It's the shape of a doorway. Jack passed right through that doorway and went straight to heaven. Another minister calling on us and trying to console us in our grief said, you shouldn't feel so bad about Jack. You should feel good over the whole thing. Why, you are the parents of an angel. He said, no, excuse me, wrong. For many years, I had done professional singing and playing for funeral homes. I guess I've listened to literally hundreds of funeral sermons by pastors of different denominations, and they all preached the departed ones went straight to heaven. I don't know that any ever went down, regardless of their character. I do remember a poor man in Moscow, Idaho, who committed suicide. The preacher didn't say where he went, whether he went up or down. He just left him hanging in space. I was so indoctrinated with that belief that the moment it was all over in Jack's room, I rushed out and down the corridor, threw open the doors, went out on the balcony. I wanted to see Jack's spirit ascend into heaven. I didn't know what I would see, but I thought I was going to see something. Hadn't we read an illustrated magazine article just a short time before about a man 
photographing the spirit leaving a body. But I didn't see anything, not a thing, but the cold stars shining above. When we started studying the Bible, we started reading it just as a little child reads its first primer. We didn't know where to find anything. We had to search for what we were looking for. Did we read any place that Jack went straight to heaven and that he was waiting day by day for mother and dad to join him there? Did we read any place that he was up there singing with the angels and praising God? Or did we read anything to lead us to believe that we were the parents of an angel? No, we didn't find anything that even sounded like that. But we found verse after verse telling us Jack was asleep in the grave, waiting for Jesus to call him. We read such scriptures as Ecclesiastes 9, 5, The living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. And Psalms 115, verse 17, The dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go down into silence. We were a little disappointed. But the Bible is true. God never makes a mistake. And he knows what is best for us. In looking for these scriptures, we found many other things we didn't know were in the Bible before. One evening, Roy looked up from his Bible and said, Rose, every time I open my Bible, it doesn't make any difference where, from the very beginning all the way through the New Testament, I read something about the commandments of God. I had noticed that, too. Roy asked Rose, What are the commandments of God? I don't know, honey, unless they are the Ten Commandments. I don't know that God has any other commandments. Well, he said, Just what are the Ten Commandments? Why, I said, You should know what the Ten Commandments are. Everyone knows what they are. You're not supposed to lie and steal. Ah, oh, yes, he said, I know that. But I'd like to read them. Where are they in the Bible? I'm sure I don't know, but we'll find them. By this time, we had discovered that the concordance could be a great help to us. We soon found where the Ten Commandments were. Perhaps I read a little faster than Roy did, for I found something about halfway down the list that I didn't want him to see. He asked so many questions. He was always asking me questions that I couldn't answer, and I didn't want him to see this. I tried to call his attention to something else. Well, all I've got to say is that you're a fine Christian. You've been at, at me for over 25 years to go to Sunday school and church with you telling me where I was going if I didn't go with you, and you don't even know why you've been going on the first day of the week. I said, now, no, Rory, I, I don't know why. We're going to find out. I want to know. How can we find out, I asked. We both hunted, we read, we searched, but we had no one to help us. We'll get someone to help us, Roy suggested. You have many minister friends in the city. I did know several ministers because of my contact with them in the funeral homes. We're going to invite one of your friends and his wife to come over and have dinner with us some night, Roy continued. I want him to find that scripture for us. Chapter 3 a search for truth. Can you imagine my surprise when my husband suggested to me that we entertain a minister in our home? That had never happened before. My mind flew back to when I was a little girl and mother and father had invited the old Baptist minister for dinner. It was a very special occasion. 
what preparations the whole <laughs> the whole house had to be renovated my mother was always a neat housekeeper but on this occasion the curtains all had to come down and be washed and stretched the woodwork had to be scrubbed do you remember your grandmother's heavy white bedspreads they all had to be scrubbed on the board and ironed a day or two before the dinner mother said to me now honey couldn't you run upstairs and straighten up all the old shoes i wanted to say mama surely the preacher's not going up there to look at our old shoes but we didn't talk to our parents like that in those days when the day finally arrived, Mother started in <laughs> on us children. I had four brothers. They were all good children, but they were rascals. She started in. <clears throat> you will remember your table manners today. Don't do this and don't do that. There were many more don'ts than do's. She So we invited one of the ministers, and the invitation was accepted. I told Roy, honey, pick the biggest. I thought it was going to be the biggest minister, but she says, honey, pick the biggest, fattest red hen out there. After all, this is the first time we've ever entertained a minister in our home, and we want to make an impression on him. The minister and his wife came, and after dinner we went into the living room to spend the evening. As I was seating our guests, Roy casually picked up a Bible, stopped in front of the minister and said, You know, Rose and I just joined the Christian church. Yes, he said, we heard, and we're happy for you. And we are starting to study the Bible, but there are so many things we don't understand and so many things we can't find, especially one text we've been looking for. Could you please find it for us? <clears throat> he reached up, took the Bible out of Roy's hand and said, Why, yes, Brother Slaybaugh, what is it? I'll find it for you in just a moment. Will you find the text authorizing the change from worship on the seventh day to the first day of the week? The minister, very much puzzled, looked at Roy a moment, turned red, started to squirm a little, then closed the Bible and placed it on the little table within reach. Then he looked over to the fireplace and said, what a beautiful deer head you have up there. We hunted and fished all the rest of the evening. We never did get back to the Bible or the Sabbath question. And when our guests were gone, Rory turned to me and said, Rose, did I say something wrong to that man? I said, no, you didn't say anything wrong to him. But after all, Roy... It wasn't entirely his fault. We just started telling him about our hunting and fishing trips, and he was telling us about his hunting and fishing trips. Don't worry. We know a lot more ministers. We'll ask another one to come in. Well, we surely didn't get very much out of that chicken, did we? <laughs> we did ask another minister, and another, and another, until the chicken coop was almost empty. And still, we didn't know anything. They gave us many answers to our questions. For instance, one of them said, Why, Brother Slaybaugh, we all admit that Saturday is the Bible Sabbath, but why be so technical? Another said, You mean the Ten Commandments? Why, the Ten Commandments were done away with. They were nailed to the cross. We are living in modern times. Another said, you mean the Ten Commandments? We don't keep the Ten Commandments. That was Moses' moral code for the Jews. This went on. 
until I was becoming alarmed about Rory. He had faith in these men. Finally, as one was leaving one night, he said, Rose, what in the world is the matter with these fellows? Why does everyone that we have had out here give us different reasons for breaking the fourth commandment and for not keeping the seventh day Sabbath? At least, why don't they all get together and give the same answer? I said, now, Roy, we're not going to be hasty in this. There's a reason, and we're going to get to the bottom of it. I would like to invite just one more. Who is it? I'd like to invite the minister from the Methodist Church here in Deer Park. I've met her, and she's a fine Christian lady. A lady? A lady minister? I said, yes, a lady minister. Disgustedly, he said, Rose, if these educated men can't tell us such a simple thing, what do you expect of a woman? I'm not sure that answer would fly today, but anyway, this was 1950s. Roy, please, may I invite her? Perhaps I can talk to her a little better than to the men. All right, if it will make you feel better. So we invited this minister and her helper. Another poor chicken got it in the neck. Then after dinner, the same question. Can you please help us find what we are looking for? Yes, she said, I'll be glad to help. What is it? Roy asked her to find that scripture. She held the Bible in her hand and said, Brother Slayball, you could search this Bible from cover to cover, and you couldn't find such a scripture. There is no such text in the Bible. <clears throat> well, he said, then please tell us this. Is Sunday the Sabbath? Oh, no, she said, Sunday isn't the Sabbath. Saturday is the Bible Sabbath. Sunday is the Lord's Day. Well, he said, it doesn't make sense to me. You know, the Sabbath was changed, she said. When? Oh, long, long ago, many hundreds of years ago, so long ago it's almost forgotten. We were glad, she said, almost forgotten. I said, please tell us who is responsible for this change. Very hesitantly, she said, I have heard that the Catholic Church had something to do with it, but don't you worry about that one minute. You just go right on attending church every Sunday morning, as you are used to doing in Spokane, and come and worship with us on Wednesday evening at prayer meeting. We could hardly wait until those ladies were gone. I looked at Roy and said, What do you think of that? That's the worst one we've heard yet. Don't you believe it? No, he said, I don't believe it. I don't believe a word of it. I don't believe anyone on this earth. I don't care who he is, what church or what denomination it is. I don't believe anyone on this earth would dare to change one of God's laws. I had to do some fast thinking. I said, honey, if such a thing has been done, we'll find it in history. We'll find it in the history of the early churches. That's right, he said. So down to the city we went, to the library. We told the librarian what we were looking for and asked if she could help us. She said, I know just what you are looking for. So many people have been in here recently asking for the same thing. She took us around a corner and brought us down and brought down several large volumes, one after another. I said, surely this will be plenty. The lady helped us find what we were looking for. She turned the pages, and there we read with our own eyes that what the lady minister had told us had really happened. What were we to do now? 
Was there any church in existence that still honored God's commandments? We had a big job. We started searching and reading doctrines of the different churches. One by one, the creeds had to be put aside until finally we were reading the doctrines of a people, small in number, who believed in the Bible and the Ten Commandments. They believed in honoring all of the commandments, even the fourth. They even believed in keeping holy the seventh day of the week. Who were they? No one else but the Seventh-day Adventists. We kept on studying. How did we study? When Roy would think I had fallen sound asleep, he would quietly steal out of the room, close the door, and then I would wait for hours until one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning. Sometimes I would put on a robe and go out to where he was sitting. The room would be blue with smoke, and he would be puffing away, first cigarettes, then his pipe, then a cigar. There would be a pot of coffee brewing, strong black coffee. Occasionally by his side, there would be a glass of beer. There, there he would be sitting, poring over the Bible and learning the truths of God. Okay, now we're at chapter 4. Let's check the time. My mother came to visit us about this time. As she opened her suitcase, she laid out three little books. She said, Rose, I brought these along. I thought perhaps you would like to read them. I said, Mother, where did you get those books? I have been attending what they call a tabernacle meeting in Yakima. She said, there was a little book stand at the door where they sold books and Bibles and other literature. The last night I was there, the lady in charge asked me if I wouldn't like to have some of their books. They were only three for a dollar. I said to her, pick me out three you think I will enjoy reading. And these are the ones she picked out for me. I said, mother. What denomination were these people? Oh, she said, I heard that they were Seventh-day Adventist. Mother, you should know better than to bring anything like that into our home. We're having enough trouble as it is. How frightened we were of the truth. How prejudiced, and yet we were searching for light. I put the books away, but it seemed that somehow they were always laid back on the table. By this time, Roy and I had read the Bible through together. We had come to the book of Revelation, and we had read about the seven last plagues and a battle called Armageddon. We couldn't understand it at all. As I was putting the little books away one afternoon, I noticed the name of one of them. On the eve of Armageddon, I showed it to Roy that night and said, Roy, look, what do you suppose Seventh-day Adventists would know about the Battle of Armageddon? Well, he answered, I don't know, but let's read it. We'll be careful. That night we started. I would read a chapter, and every time I came to a scripture, Roy would look it up in the Bible to see if it was there. Then he would read a chapter, and I would look up all the scriptures. We finished the book. How did Seventh-day Adventists know so much about all these deep Bible prophecies? How could they make the Bible so easy to understand? Rose, Roy said, what are the other books? Here they are, Prophecy Speaks and The Marked Bible which reminds me, the Marked Bibles was one of the books I thought maybe we could read together. So if time should last, maybe we'll read it. But going on, we, we read them. We were learning something. We wondered where they, we could get more books like these. I said, 
I know where we can get them, at John W. Graham's in the city. They have a large book and stationery store, four stories high. Are you sure they would have them? Of course they would have them, I said. The next time we went in the city, we took a list, for we had found on the fly leaf of one of the little books names of others which sounded interesting. We had picked out eight or ten. As we were driving into the city, Roy said, Now, Rose, while you're shopping, be sure to go to Graham's and get the books so we will have something new to read tonight. How disappointed I was when my little list of books was handed from one clerk to another. They looked up and down, under and over, and they couldn't find them. Finally, the head clerk said, Oh, no, it was called. Why, of course we have them, he said. We must have just sold all we had on the shelves. Let me have that list. I'll go down in the stock room and bring them up. I waited. Soon he came back. He handed me the list and said, I'm sorry, lady. We must have just sold out. But you come back in a week or ten days and we'll have a fresh supply. As we were driving home, Roy said, Did you get the books, honey? They didn't even have one of them, I said. Oh, he said, I'm sorry. I was just hoping we'd have something new to study tonight. Pardon me, but I know what we can do. We can't. Why can't we send to the publishing house and get them? As soon as we reached home, we looked to see where these books were published and found that it was in Tacoma Park, Washington, D.C. We didn't send for only eight or ten. <laughs> we wrote and told them to send all they had. I wish you could have seen what came. We, we were right in the midst of harvest. Roy went down one noon to get the mail and brought the big box of books home. We opened it and decided it was a holiday. He said, let the old wheat rot out there. We're going to learn something tonight. We um, handed the books out by the handful to our hired help. There were books all the way through the kitchen, the dining room, the living room, and clear out onto the front porch. And I have to stop soon, but maybe a few more paragraphs here. A few days later, Rory came in and said, Rose, if I don't get more help, we'll never get this crop harvested. We had a large harvest that year, and help was scarce, for many of the young men were in the army. I just wonder if Joe could come and help us. Joe is the oldest boy brother in the Slaybaugh family. He lived with Mother Slaybaugh at Pomeroy, Washington, and he agreed to come and help us. <clears throat> we were glad to have him come for more than one reason. He was a church member and one of the deacons in the Pomeroy Christian Church. We knew he would bring his Bible and would be a wonderful help to us in our study. But when we asked him about some of the things we had been studying, he looked at us and said, I believe, Roy and Rose, that you are going crazy over religion. You are becoming regular fanatics. Why can't you be satisfied? Just because you've lost Jack, don't lose your minds over religion. Roy said, how can we be satisfied when we're learning so many things that are not right in the churches and so many new truths from the Bible? Joe, why don't you read just one of these little books, just any one you want, and learn something for yourself? Oh, no. The Seventh-day Adventists might fool you, but they're never, they will never fool me. Joe always read his Bible before breakfast. He'd sit in the living room every morning and read his Bible. One morning, a few days after this happened, Roy called me and said, Rose, 
come here and see what I see. Joe, <laughs> Joe is nipping at one of the little books we bought. I walked to where he was and said, Joe, isn't it wonderful? And that is where we will stop for tonight. And I'm just glad all of you have joined us. I hope it's been a blessing. Let's close with prayer, shall we? Father, we are so thankful we can gather together as a family of brothers and sisters in the faith. And I ask that your special blessing on each one who has been listening. I thank you for the um, ideas that have been shared here at the end. Please help us to study with the intensity that they studied at the beginning, to love truth and to keep reading because we can't remember, at least I can't remember everything I learned years ago, just like I've read this story years ago, and some of it is new to me again. So please bless us in our st study. Give us your presence, your spirit at all times and the presence of your angels to keep us safe and especially Bree with Brother Don as he travels back to Florida tomorrow. Keep him safe in the air on the ground and have a safe arrival at home. And we thank you for your love for us, for his willingness to spend time with us. Please bless him as he leaves and bless each of us as we go our separate ways now. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And until thank we you. meet again, may God bless and keep you. And bye for now. Bye.